Welcome back to another interview in our series, Chat with Pros. Today we're talking with Dave Lewis. Dave is a composer for visual media, which means that he does things like film scores and compositions for trailers and commercials and video games. He's worked for networks such as Netflix and Fox and PBS, and he's also worked for brands such as Cadillac and Dropbox and Vogue. He's gotten to do a lot of very cool things. He's also a drummer. He and I met many years ago at the Berklee College of Music, and that's where our friendship started. We've been friends ever since, and we've been on this journey together. He's a very inspiring personality, an incredible teacher. He's got a lot to share about the world of film scoring, so we're going to dive right into that. Let's join our conversation with Dave Lewis. All right, Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. First, before we dive deep into the world of film scoring, can you just give us a little bit of a brief history of how you got from just learning how to play an instrument to now where you are deep into the film scoring world? Oh boy. Well, it's been a lifelong journey. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, yeah, man. I, I mean, music has been something that I live, breathe every day, my entire life. I, I grew up with music. My father plays tabla, which is an uh, Indian classical drum. It's a hand drum. And I grew up immersed in Indian music and culture. Uh, from a young kid. And then eventually, I think I got into piano around second or third grade. I, I, I got hooked into music when we all played recorder in the third grade. So if you ever play recorder in elementary I'm school. I'm surprised you got hooked by the recorder. Oh, so much fun. I love recorder. And uh, so yeah, so I was so in love with playing an instrument uh, in class that I had actually requested my elementary school teacher uh, at school to give me private piano lessons. And so she was my piano teacher for a long time. And yeah, I, I did the recitals. I used the, the Alfred's books and, and I was always just engaged by her enthusiasm for music and the fact that I was really enjoying the songs that I was playing um, and made my segue into drumming. I, I went to Interlochen. It's a, a camp for the arts in Michigan. I went there, this is the summer between sixth and seventh grade. Long story short, I went there, a piano player, came home a drummer, and uh, my parents were thrilled. So, yeah, I, uh, that's awesome. It was great. And so, yeah, I played drums all through high school, uh, was in a, in a couple of rock bands, punk bands, learned how to play jazz, uh, ended up going to the Berkeley College of Music, and really, really, really enjoyed my time there. That's where I met you. That's where I met a whole, just a bunch of incredible friends and musicians that I still am very close with today. And yeah, for a long time, I was a touring session, performing musician in and around Los Angeles. I was also a music teacher for a long time. I still have a few students now. And uh, that was my life for a very, very long time as a player. And in 2015, roughly, I made the transition into producing music and getting into film scoring. So uh, I just took a gig having no real clue what I was doing. Uh, a friend of mine asked me to co-score a, a short film with her. And I just said, yes, why not? Let's do it. And I just fell in love with the whole process. I love the ability to tell a story through music and, and to create emotional support uh, behind what people are seeing on the screen. And I just, yeah, I fell in love with the process and continue to do that uh, as, as a novice, let's say, until I really decided to take it seriously and go to school again and uh, graduated from USC's film scoring program. And uh, I'm doing film composing professionally now. That's great. That's amazing. So when you were at Berkeley, what was your major? I, so <laughs> I had, I think, five different majors. I started out as a performance major and then decided, OK, this is, I, I, can, I can focus on performing. I can focus on playing, but I should study something else, because that seems like the smart thing to do, right? So I did contemporary writing production and I had no idea what I was doing. So I quit that, went to songwriting, didn't like that, went to business, didn't like that. So we ended up doing, uh, what did I do? Professional music, which is- uh, That's where you kind of mix everything together. You just do whatever, you sort of build your own major, exactly. So it was a combination of business production and performance. Um, yeah, I, I really love Berkeley. It was such an amazing experience, just meeting all these incredible musicians uh, and, and being able to connect with those people and, and still, uh, work with them today so well berkeley is a good example of kind of what we wanted to build with sound life in the sense that we had a community beyond what we learned in our classrooms 
the sense of community of always having people to interact with and bounce ideas off of and jam with. And then when we moved to Los Angeles, we already had this community sort of built that helped us get through a very difficult time when we were all trying to make a name for ourselves and make a living and build a career. Um, we had one another. And so I think Berkeley, Berkeley is, the, is a great example of that. Berkeley fosters that for sure. Um, just the, being immersed in that community and, and finding like-minded individuals that you, you want to share with. I mean, that, that's, it's different being a professional in LA where you have a gig, you have your family, you sort of, you, you have your, your set ways of doing things. Uh, but as you know, when you're younger and you're hungry just to play and to jam and you just want to share and collaborate, it's such a cool community and you find some really great circles of people jam sessions at two, three in the morning. Um, people always wanting to share knowledge and it's, uh, yeah, it's just, a, it's such a cool community. It's really yeah, great. And you are all speaking the same language at that stage because you all came from your high school bands all around the country learning the same type of material and suddenly you're in a room together and you can all communicate. And it's, uh, oh, yeah. that's, that's an exciting feeling. Okay, so let's go to film scoring as a concept. We have tremendous amounts of students and young learners who are interested in music as a whole. But when we break that down, we know that there's so many umbrellas underneath of that. So many different worlds and avenues that someone could go into. And even film scoring as a concept, we know when we watch a movie, there's music going on. But break down for us what is actually happening when we're listening to something or we're watching something. You know, how many pieces go into that? How many people are involved in this? Oh my goodness, uh, well, that's, that's a very loaded question. Uh, there can be a lot, there can be more, more than a few people, uh, or it can be all just one person. It really depends on, on what level you're at as a composer. It depends on the budget of a film and what you're allotted, uh, how much time you have. So it really, it's, there's so many different factors, but yes, I mean, as composers, we, we are creating the musical score to accompany a film. That's, that's the most general, understanding of what a film composer does. Um, we want to, uh, you know, use, typically the way it starts is um, I'll sit down with the director and we'll have a spotting session. And so a spotting session is when you and the director watch the film together, you, you go through it and you pick what scenes are gonna have music. You also pick what, what type of music you want. And so that's, that's another <clears throat> big question, uh, you know, to answer your question about how many people are involved because sometimes you have a full orchestra. And so in that case, you could have a hundred piece orchestra in a, in a scoring stage where you have to, first of all, come up with your ideas, come up with your concepts, your themes, um, any sort of, um, uh, we call them cues. So they're little short bits of music. Typically there's, uh, I would say roughly half the amount of time in a film has music. So if you have a two hour film, you'll typically, and in this of course it can vary, but you'll have one hour of music. And so, these are often cues that are, that are literally, they could be a minute and a half, they could be five seconds, they could be four and a half minutes, but they're usually, you know, different cues throughout a movie that you, you know, you have a concept, you come up, create an idea, a theme, for example, um, it could be underscore, which again is just, um, is music in the background that uh, will support emotionally or, or it can support the action, it can support, a beautiful landscaping, it can support anything, right? And and typically that's music that enhances what people are seeing on screen. And that's different than, for example, um, uh, diegetic music, or also known as source music, where the actor on screen is also hearing the music, for example. So someone's in a parade and there's a marching band in the parade. So the actor in the film would actually be hearing that, or they're in a nightclub uh, or at a bar and there's a band playing in the background. That would be considered the source. But this is a good question. That music is someone else's responsibility. Correct, correct. So there's all different types of music. And of course, there's thematic music. So certain things that you hear when you see a particular character come on screen. And that's really important too. So, so you want to be able to differentiate how you calibrate composing and, and creating these, these musical identities uh, for different things. Now, when you say thematic, I think of Star Wars and Darth Vader's sure. song versus Luke Skywalker's song. Absolutely, 100%. That's a great example. John Williams is the master at creating themes for his characters. Uh, also, 
Think of uh, the Dark Knight, you know, the Batman movies, uh, Joker's theme, Batman's theme. Uh, you know, you 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 hear it could be a, a two note thing. It could be Jaws. There's another John Williams Jaws. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, right. So you hear that little half step going back and forth, and you know the shark's coming, even when the shark's not on screen, even if it's still 30 seconds away from, from showing its face, you know it's coming. And that's the power of music. So if we're gonna break down this process, you sit down with the director and then you kind of get an idea for what is needed and then you come up with, if we're going with a thematic concept, the themes, then what? You have to orchestrate these themes and decide how they're gonna build inside of a film, right? Maybe talk a bit about what, what that process looks like. Sure. Okay, so after a spotting session with a director, I'll, the next step would be to create a workshop. So I'll come up with some ideas. And I always, I, I love collaborations. I love sort of going back and forth with directors, um, not just kind of hiding away in my studio for a couple of weeks or a month and just, just kind of working on stuff and then showing it later. I like to do things in real time. So I'll bounce ideas back and forth. Once we get a good concept, this is a good idea for a theme, I'll develop that theme. And that theme can be used across a film uh, in a variety of ways. And so that can, for example, be orchestrated, right? So orchestra orchestration is, the easiest way to think of orchestration is think of a, a chord. You know, you play a chord on a piano, like a C major chord. And how do I take that chord and expand it for an entire orchestra? Where the strings, the brass, the woodwinds, even, even a choir can, can somehow play that chord to make it sound massive, right? And so it's the, the concept of, of um, adapting a certain musical progression or theme or whatever to, to fit for an entire orchestra. And so there are people who do that standalone, that's, that's their job, is they're orchestrators. So a composer can write a theme and say, here's your theme, make this sound like a big orchestra. Um, other times, usually in my case, I do it myself. I like having control over what instruments play what notes, um, what instruments play the theme, for example, the melody, and other instruments play um, uh, a supporting role. So you can orchestrate your music. So you, you can have it for as big or as small an ensemble as you want. Um, but there's another thing. What if it's not orchestra? What if it's all synths, right? You want to do an entire synth score. That's also fun, too. You get to play, mess, mess with all the knobs and buttons and 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 just you know create these really fun sounds and create your score that way uh trent reznor is a great a great example trent reznor atticus ross uh they did the score for social network they recently did the score for soul uh also the mu uh the music for mank which uh, i don't know if you've seen that it's a real old school uh, orson wells type film it's really cool um just came out on netflix i am not and but i'm gonna check that out now it's it, you know they're surprisingly versatile and uh and and quite brilliant uh we all see them as just you know the guys in nine inch nails who are a bunch of synth guys uh who are extremely talented with that too but they they can do it all they're really incredible but they started out a lot with synthesizers so there's a first there's sort of the, the first next step after creative workshopping is okay what am i going to do musically how am i going to tell this story with different instruments do i want an orchestra do i want um, synthesizers? Do I want something crazy and avant-garde? Do I want just drums? You know, the whole thing could be just drums if I wanted. It could be weird, you know, uh, aleatoric choirs. It could be whatever, it could, whatever you want. And so once you decide that, then you can start to bring a team together. So in a team, you have your, of course, your composer, you have your orchestrator, you would have a music editor. Music editor is someone who basically just places the music into the film and often works very closely with the director. So it's one step the composer doesn't necessarily have to deal with um, after completing a, a score or a cue. They can send it off to the music editor and the music editor will place it into the film and then show the director. And so sort of it's like a middleman between the composer and the director. Um, uh, there's always a composer's assistant who does all the work that uh, is not the fun, exciting, creative work. Uh, it could be working with MIDI or, or calibrating certain sounds to sound a certain way. Um, and that's actually a really good point. Um, so typically, and a lot of times when I'm working on a project, I don't have a budget to hire a full orchestra because that can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we have what are called uh, sound libraries, plugins. These are 
computer generated instruments where um, you have a, a sound library, you can purchase them. There's many different companies. And I use Logic, there's Logic, there's Pro Tools, there's Cubase, many different platforms where you can create music. And inside of those platforms, you have libraries where you can have strings, you can have brass, you can have drums, synthesizers, guitars, choirs, and it's all fake. They're not real. Well, these days they're, they're sampled very, very well from, real, from live orchestras, but, but they are not real players when you're creating your piece. They're, they're yeah. completely generated. And we use this on a MIDI keyboard and we are basically sending information to the computer and it's being read by these libraries and you can, you can express yourself. Um, uh, so I'm getting really technical, but you can express, you can kind of decide how you want those, those instruments to sound through expression or modulation and make them sound as realistic as possible. And the technology is so good these days that you can make it sound like a really believable orchestra, even though it's all fake. And so that's typically how most composers are, are doing their work these days is uh, with sound libraries. And so, yeah, that's incredible. That is tremendous. So, right, so let's imagine we've got uh, um, someone that is interested in film scoring as something that they can do on their own. And now, of course, because of COVID over the last year, um, we've all been isolated. And a lot of younger musicians now are very savvy with using Logic or Pro Tools. They have an interface, they have a MIDI keyboard, and they're aware of how to record, how to edit, and you know they're aware of their sound libraries. How does this person get into film scoring? What, what is something that they could do on their own now by themselves to start messing around with this world? That's a great question. I think just doing it. You just find a video on YouTube. When you, when you extract the video on YouTube, you can just dump the sound, the original score, and score it yourself. I think that's a great place to start, is either doing that, so you, you find a scene from a movie, uh, a two minute scene on YouTube, and all you do is mute the music, write your own, and you have your own score right there. Um, and with Logic, you can import that directly into the session. You can import it into Logic, I use Logic, so there's other, other platforms, I'm not sure how it works, but in Logic, it'll ask you if you want to extract the audio track, and so you want to say yes. So you have your own audio track file that you can mute or solo or, or do whatever with, um, and, and obviously you would you just mute that, and then you now have a completely silent piece of, uh, of film that you can score music to. So that's one way to do it, just for fun, for practice. There, you, be careful, you don't want to put that out into the world because of copyright issues. Um, if it's for educational purposes, of course it's fine, but you're not gonna try to use that uh, unless you explicitly state that this is a rescore or for educational purposes only because big studios like Warner Brothers and Fox and Universal don't like that. So, um, I can imagine but, that's, why, but that's a fantastic exercise. Something to keep in mind, but if you just keep it all contained, you can share it with your friends, of course, but you know, that's, that gets into the legal stuff. But it's, for practicing, it's great. People do it all the time. I think that's a really good idea to practice uh, scoring scenes um, to picture. And these are, of course, professionally made films. You know, when I was at USC, I got to rescore scenes from Moana, from Skyfall, from Prometheus. Um, God, there's a ton of them. Uh, Harvey Milk, the, the movie they made about Harvey Milk. I did the, the candlelight vigil. And I got to record that with a 54, no, 56 piece orchestra at Warner Brothers. That was just incredible. And so uh, just the feeling of being there with a the live orchestra um, was, was life changing, to be honest, it was incredible. Uh, but because it was for educational purposes, it was just a rescore from a, a scene that's from, from a, a well-known movie. So that's the first thing. The second thing you can do is collaborate with friends. If, if, if your students who are getting into scoring music have other friends that are into making their own home movies and they have the equipment and they, they know how to shoot and do a five minute short, well, they should collaborate. They should reach out and just say, hey, I'd love to score your film. Yeah. Simple as that. That's a wonderful idea. Okay, so now let's talk about the skills you started out as a piano student taking lessons to a drummer, then going to college and obviously getting a lot of different types of information with the degree that you, you went with. But along the way, we're talking about learning to read music. We're learning, talking about learning to notate music. 
learning how to record music, understanding MIDI, and you, you, the skill sets that are involved here are, are vast, probably more so than a lot of other avenues that a musician could go down. Um, what's something that students could, um, that students are probably learning now that they could work on to help develop these skills? That's a great question. Um, and on a, on a side note, I, I always love to bring this back to math. When I was a student, when I was in elementary, junior high and high school, I never really truly had an understanding of why I was learning math. No one really told me, oh, well, you can utilize math. You could, you could become an architect. You could become a scientist. You could be an astronaut. You know, you could, whatever career that utilizes what we're learning right now in class, whether it's geometry or algebra, I just never really had that concept. And so for me, it was kind of like, oh, it's just a bunch of busy work. Had I known what I can use this for as, as a career, as something that I'm very passionate about, would have been really, really helpful. So that's the importance of music to me because you can do so much with it. Um, yes, it's, it's fun, it's gratifying, it, it lifts you up, it, it heals, but there's also a technical aspect that is very, very important to understand. It is its own language. And being able to speak that language opens a lot of doors depending on what kind of career you want to get into. Now, as a film composer, especially starting out, you basically do everything yourself. So you are, of course, the composer, you're your own editor, your own orchestrator. Um, other jobs that I didn't mention would be uh, preparing your own scores, right? And so if I'm gonna write out the music, if I have a rhythm, bum, 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 right? I have to know exactly what kind of notate, what we know notation that's gonna be rhythmically and then notate it on the score so that I can write that for every instrument and then of course break it off into different parts and, and give it to the players and have it be readable, right? They wanna be able to read it and play it, and be done with it. So understanding rhythms, uh, melodies, ear training. Oh, ear training is the most important thing. Recognizing intervals, recognizing rhythms, recognizing um, anything and being able just to so just innately just know what it is because of having great training and, and utilizing it to your advantage, uh, whether you're on a scoring stage or whether you're just writing out parts or whether you just have a really vast musical knowledge and are able to compose and create themes quickly and effectively and do it well, right? Because in my mind, there's two kinds of composers. There's, there's composers who have a, a very strong uh, skill set and knowledge base who understand harmony, ear training, rhythm, and people who just sort of throw stuff at the wall and hope it sticks and just, just guess and, and, tr and, and just kind of try a bunch of ideas and randomly just you know, try stuff before they think it sounds good because they have no understanding of theory. And I can't tell you how much more fun it is to be able to draw up an idea and to have the technical understanding to make that a reality and not to go through 50 iterations of trying out before it just simply works, right? So if I have an idea of what rhythm I want, I know what that rhythm is. If I have some melody, I know exactly what those notes are. I know the, the interval jump I, you know, because of my ear training, because of taking music lessons. And being able to, to have an idea and make it tangible is, I mean, that's the very essence of, of being a film composer is being able to do that without guessing, without yeah, hoping. I, love, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I believe we are musical problem solvers. Yeah. And, um, you know, the larger our utility belt is, the, the more problems we can solve. Yes, um, problem solving. There you go. And then I could have summed that all up with, with two words. No, but I love, the, I love how you broke that down. Okay, yeah. so just to wrap things up, what are a couple things that you're working on right now that um, you're very excited about? I am very excited about the show that I, well, I was working on it the second half of last year. Um, and I, I'm so bummed because by the time this comes out, I'm sure it's going to be out in the open. But right now, this very moment, I'm not allowed to talk about it. It's, it's a Netflix show. It's an animated cartoon. Um, it's awesome. It's super cool. 
I, I, wa I so badly want to talk about it. Um, the only hint I can give is, is guys like you and I, we, we definitely watched this show when we were probably eight or nine years old and they're bringing it back. Oh, I've probably already seen That's much. super cool, but that's awesome. Yeah, You're coming out on Netflix. That's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's really exciting. So, so I got hired to do that. Uh, I'm also, I'm pitching for another big gig right now. Uh, again, it's all this hush hush stuff. So, but currently, so I was doing that. Uh, I'm also a music producer. So recently I've been producing a couple of records, an artist out of Oakland and an artist out of Chicago. And uh, I also worked on a PBS series called Iron Maidens. It's an all girl high school robotics team. They're in a competition in New York. It's a really cool show. Um, and then what else am I working on right now? Oh, there's so much stuff. Um, a lot of, I do a lot of commercial work as well. I've done a lot of trailers, movie trailers. And so I'm always keeping myself busy, but the, the Netflix show is definitely the big one. And, and I'll let you know as soon as I can talk about it, but. As soon as you can, we'll re-update our interview. and put Okay, it okay, okay. But yeah, but I, I've been told from, from the top down, I'm, I'm not allowed to say anything. Oh yeah, uh, don't, don't, don't ruin that. Well, thank I, I told you, one thank friend. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to share all of this with us today. And I can't wait to see how it inspires everybody moving forward. Thank you, man. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course.